He's going to be hosting his 8 o'clock p.m. show tonight. Well, don't you think this is a little premature to be uh, have Mayorkas on every Sunday show celebrating that they cut the numbers in half from 10,000 to 5,000 a day? Premature or false? And I say false, not denying the statistics that might be reported today, but false in painting a picture that hasn't existed before and won't exist after this momentary blip in time. You know, if I could, I'd love to do a quick fact check on the opening of the Brian Kilmeade show. So, first of all, it is one of the most emasculating things that can be imagined to ride a bike. To your point of the president riding a bike, I think the only thing worse would if he were riding a scooter. Right. I don't mean a moped. Even Barack Obama, who looks cool, never looked good on a bike. No, you do. I don't care. Look, you could be an athlete. You could be Lance Armstrong. You don't look cool on a bike. With that helmet. Oh, and then the helmet takes you down another four notches. He has his aviators on, so he can look like a fighter pilot, but he's wearing a helmet riding a bike and he's the leader of the free world second do we really call this uh high atop the fox news headquarters we're on like the 15th floor and this thing goes way up and y'all introduce the show as though you're high atop the show finally most approachable radio host don't you think (laughs) (laughs) i mean let's be honest if you need directions you're coming up to me who's who's in the running Put it this way. I was I had to buy Dawn, uh, who I married and is the mother of my children. I decided that for her, she I'd go to Hand and Stone and get a gift certificate for her. While I'm sitting there, a guy walks off the street, walks up to me, two story, and says, Can I have directions to the uh dog and cat rescue? Out of everybody in line, he comes up to me, dog and cat rescue. Does not think I work at Fox or anything. I have to look on my GPS device. Oh, you did? He doesn't have one. I found out that because he had a flip phone. I found out the dog and cat rescue had to write it down. If that isn't approachable, Will Kane, what is? Okay, I'm not saying you're not approachable, but before we crown you with the title, I just wanted to run through my mind. Let's see, there's, let's say, Clay and Buck, Dan Bongino, Mark Levin, Glenn Beck. Keep going. If you guys were all standing on a street corner, and I'm trying to think who else could be in the running here, you want to throw some sports figures in there, like, I don't know, like Mike Greenberg? You guys are all standing on a street corner, and someone needs directions. Do you go to Brian Kilmeade first? All right. I gotta I'm going to say something. Got to put in uh, uh, Fale, uh, uh, Jimmy Fela. Fela and Ga- oh, Guy, Guy Benson. Oh, Guy. Guy Benson. But everybody you lined up, okay. tell me, tell me okay. who's more approachable. I'm going to say this. You're not high atop the Fox News headquarters. But? But you might be the most approachable. Thank you very right much. Host. Listen, we were, we were on 18. It made more sense we were on 18. We got to 15. Then we're all of a sudden, I can, I can. it's hard to say. I just want the listeners to trust you, and I just worry Coming out of the gates with that kind of no one has ever pointed that out. No one has ever pointed high atop with something of controversy that I've said. Right, you know Levin's like intro. You know where he's like, what is it in his secret lair bunkered down? Let me just tell you this: (laughs) I like Mark Levin. Uh, He's done some really nice things for me. But no one is asking directions to the dog and cat rescue (laughs) to Mark Levin while he's online for a hand and stone massage. Takes off the glasses. Listen here. <laughs> you go right at the corner. <laughs> <laughs> then you're going to see the sign. Right. <laughs> Why are you asking me? Uh, it's part of the whole Marxist thing. Uh, I mean, the, Marxism, everybody's got to get direction from everybody else right. instead of being on our own just to get lost like we used to. All right. So All right. what were we saying? Let's talk about 2024. We haven't done that. First off, thanks for hanging around Saturday night. That was a long day for you. Especially no you got to get primed up. For the next day, Sunday, and then you got to ready to do five days at 8 o'clock this week. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so on 2024, I did not realize this when we did the show. And actually, we shouldn't have. I, I don't know if I could have realized this. But Ron DeSantis, after doing his second speech, went to the one mile from where Donald Trump was supposed to give his speech and canceled it. And he went over to a famous restaurant and then went outside a picnic table. And he and his wife took questions and, and, and took pictures with everybody. That that's good gamesmanship. That's a guy that wants to win. Should he get into this race? What do you think about that? You know, I still wonder. So I, I, I told you this this weekend. This isn't a game of should. This isn't a game of preference. This is a game of just simply ob- observation. Ron DeSantis has the track record. He has the, the job that he's done in Florida. He has like all the stake. The question is, does he have the sizzle? And Donald Trump undoubtedly has all of the sizzle. I mean, he's a rock star. He's blockbuster. And the question remains about Ron DeSantis is, 
A, can he be a retail politician shaking hands and smiling and connecting with human beings on a one-on-one level, which I think still matters in politics? And B, can he commandeer um, or command a stage and a podium in a way that makes people want to follow? I should say C, can he do it at the same time that Donald Trump is on that same stage going back and forth throwing haymakers in a debate? And so I just wonder about all of those elements. And I'm not telling you again that it's right or wrong or should or shouldn't or preference. I'm just telling you the way that I think that it is. And it is necessary for him to have that sizzle. And, Will, this is Street and Smith pregame report before the Internet when they used to say, hey, put out the magazines and tell you the chances your team had to win. And they have a section where it says, here's the positives, here's the negatives. And there's the question. That's called setting it up. I, I love the fact that you say you don't know because I'm surprised how many people know. They know the best way to deal with Trump is you fight him. The best way to deal with Trump is you ignore him. Well, you don't want to have him on his page. How could they I, know? I don't know. Well, no one is. No, that's such nonsense that somebody suggests they know. No one has successfully that. No one has beat Donald Trump. Well, I Joe mean, Biden could, did. He didn't beat. He didn't beat him in a debate. You know, I think that Joe Biden and the media and the in the national um, intelligence apparatus. All together in coordination, Zuckerbucks beat Donald Trump in coordination. And if you think that, it, it, does Ron DeSantis have all that at his disposal in a Republican primary? I don't think so. Here is what Chris Christie says: He does have a way to beat Trump. Cut fifteen. You can't beat Donald Trump by playing bumper pool and hitting it off three cushions and hope that it goes in. If it goes in the hole, um, it's that's not the way it works, John. And I think they're all making a marked mistake. As to the audience reaction, let's face it, CNN went in the tank to get Trump on there. They allowed him to negotiate who was going to be in that audience. And those were all Trump supporters. I don't care how they introduced them. Those, I know a lot of those people in that audience. I spent a lot of time in New Hampshire eight years ago, and a lot of those are the same faces that I saw eight years ago. Though you, you pay no attention to the audience reaction. Those were all people who, in the main, 80 percent or so were Trump supporters. So that was a negotiation deal that the Trump did with CNN. And I think CNN was wrong for doing it. I thought the audience was not a main part of it. You know, they cheered. But that was typical, I think, of a Republican uh, town hall of Donald Trump. I would have liked to have seen more questions. If I was her, I would have got what I had to do and just say, you know, just where do you stand on January 6th? Get it out of the way for CNN viewers. And then to ask legitimate questions. And then you could kind of play off what the audience was doing. Isn't the whole thing, and I was slow to understand this, it was a town hall. It gave her an opportunity, Caitlin Collins, to kind of back out and like, let the people ask the questions in a Republican primary. What happened to that concept? It quickly became a grilling of Donald Trump, of grievances of Trump, expecting him to somehow change the answers we all know about. Uh, if you want to have a grilling and you want to do a fact check, I'm not sure a town hall, even with what I mean by that is even with yeah. the, the dressing of a town hall, having yeah. a live studio audience, it, not only does it not um, help, it hurts because he has a crowd that he can play to and he's really good with a crowd. And that crowd was happy to hear from Donald Trump. That's if you go into it saying, I want to fact check every single thing that he says and have this be an adversarial interview. If you actually want to elicit information, yeah. then you could use the town hall. But the thing is, we it's like – I don't know if the goal was to play the greatest hits or what it may be, but like those topics are are done. So I agree. January sixth. Um, what Nobody else was cares. it? There was several of these right off the top where we just said like elections are now. The other one was elections. Four denial. years old. How about the fact that they asked him about a policy he left while in office was the separation of families? We all know now that we went over it. It was uh, Jeff Sessions' idea to do it. He implemented it. Trump didn't back off of it when it clearly went south and Melania was not even for it. Went down with the jacket on. He left it. So after a year and a half, he left this idea. She goes, "Are you going to go back to child separation?" You know, Donald Trump's like, maybe. Uh, because when families, uh, we have to send the message these people can't come. That's just Trump being Trump. But he had an easy one on that. Well, he that, had an easy one to go, yeah, I left that policy. We're the 85,000 missing kids that Joe Biden can't keep track of. Did you know about that? Were you going to bring that up? That would have been such an easy parry. And I think that every time they turned to the town hall and the voters, they did ask forward-looking questions. Yeah. Like, what will you do? Like, And you could even couch it in, hey, you didn't get this accomplished in your first term. Will you get it accomplished in your second term? You can – you. but I know that the American people, whether or not they're Republican or Democrat, are sitting here going, we need solutions moving forward. And it's reasonable to assume that Donald Trump represents those solutions. 
but you have to ask him about it. You got to ask right. him about what's coming ahead of us on the road and how he will handle that. But the thing was constantly conducted through the rearview mirror again through the rearview right. mirror. And just as amazing is they were so surprised by it in that panel afterwards. But uh, here's what Al Sharpton said about Ron DeSantis. You know, every Democrat what thinks they're going to beat Trump. So that's what they're hoping for. Cut 18. More and more every day, people are taking DeSantis less seriously. Uh, he's like a baby in a crib with a rattle wanting to be like daddy more than he looks like an adult that belongs in the living room sitting around having a discussion. I think it will come down to Biden and Trump unless something dramatically happens. And I think the more we see the tirades of Donald Trump on Mother's Day, no less, the more it reminds people, wait a minute, I don't want to go back there. And I think that that is yeah. uh, one of the assets that Joe Biden has aside from some of his achievements as president. Well, there's a lot in that in that clip from Al Sharpton. And not all of it, Brian, I think, is incorrect. I think that Ron DeSantis does have a lot to prove. I don't think he's a baby in a crib and capable of having 44. an adult conversation. Yeah. He's doing not just adult conversations. He's, he's executing adult policies in a world where actual solutions are hard to find. But he does have to find a way to distinguish himself from Donald Trump. And I don't know that DeSantis has that answer just yet. And I think that Sharpton might be right in his assessment that, I mean, the smart money, if you're betting right now, is a rematch of Biden versus Trump. I mean, that's the smart right. money. And I mean, just like if you go to any of the betting apps on politics right now, that's where it lands. It lands on right. a rematch of Biden versus Trump. I like the, you know, like you said about Al Sharpton, he's also doing gamesmanship because he wants Trump. Number two, the other thing would be is that the problem is what he said about Joe Biden. Joe Biden isn't the grandfatherly nice guy. He comes off angry almost every single day. I have not seen a mediator, a voice of reason and moderation. That has not been the guy we saw. And when we come back, what he said over the weekend that I think was really pandering. Don't move. Harsh reality that racism has long torn us apart. It's a battle that's never really over. But on the best days, enough of us have the guts and the hearts to st stand up for the best in us. To stand up against the poison white supremacy as I did my inaugural address to a single out as the most dangerous terrorist threat to our homeland is white supremacy. Great. At a historic black college, he decides to say white supremacy is the biggest threat in America. Uh, Will Cain, do you agree? Somebody should go tell all the people trying to get into America right. at the southern border. <laughs> that was a great oh, point. Why? Who are they? Those mostly white Europeans? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're right. ready to take care, take advantage of this supremacist right. culture we have here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just such a ridiculous, naked pander. And the, the line, did we cut it off right after that next line? And I'm not just saying that because I'm at a black HBCU. <laughs> That's exactly what you said. Because he knew deep down, oh, this is really obviously pandering. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, I think he got 92% of the black vote in the last election. Now it's down to 58 uh, 58%. Mm -hmm. And the way to get, get that back is to say things like this. Stoke victimhood. Larry Elder from the Belief His Stats last night when he was on with Steve Hilton he said there's been 25 uh, African-Americans who have lost their lives due to white supremacy. But in terms of black-on-black -black crime and everything else, the numbers are astronomical. This is just not an issue in America. There are always idiots out there. But to characterize America that way, I think is so detrimental. Because then it has people going, wait a second, maybe he's right. You know, with those 75 million that voted for him, maybe Joe Biden's right. Maybe we are a, a country controlled by uh, white supremacy. That's what I worry about. We're in the least racist moment in history. We are in inside of that. On is currently all of us here in the least racist country on the globe, and we are in the least racist moment of our own particular American history. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could argue that ten years ago, you know, you've seen those graphs like in the early two thousands, fifteen years ago, we were somehow. Gallup poll showing moving beyond before President Obama. Honestly, yes. If yes. you look at those polls and those graphs, it's what they yeah, show. Absolutely. So, um, so the idea that 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 we have this this sin that is the definition of everything that's wrong with this country is just this. It, it is Joe Biden pandering to divide Americans on the basis of race in order to and pit us against one another through racial resentment in order for his own personal gain. Well, could you tell me about your podcast? I know you're recording a new another one today. 
I did this. I did the Daniel Penny case. I'm really upset and fired up. I did this white supremacist thing that Joe Biden said. I did uh, – it's up this morning. I'm so mad that the media is once again showing pictures of 15-year-old Michael Jackson impersonator um, Jordan Neely, who's the guy that died in his interaction with Marine – former Marine Daniel Penny. It's just such a visual lie yeah. that happens in the media. He was 30 years old, and he was a, a con, been arrested 40 times. Can I tell you one thing before we go? You take a left. That's right. I said it. You take a left, go down the street, you arrive, it'll say the pet rescue. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> nice. See you tonight at 8 with, uh, without Mark Levin on the show. I have a sense. You know what? He'll be a good bookie for you. Not you, anymore. You, meanwhile, would read every page on the Google entry to them. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.